like others who will be making videos about the new Clone High now that its first season is wrapped up, I don't have any nostalgia for the original series. Sure, being the animation nerd I am, I've been aware of and seen clips from the 2002 show for quite a few years now, but I've only watched the first season in its entirety about a month ago in preparation for this reboot. And in a way, I think this was the best and the worst way to watch these seasons, as while I was able to avoid the nostalgia goggles that some fans of the original have, I also went into the new Clone High immediately after watching the old Clone High, meaning that, internally, I was expecting it to be a season 2 in the vein of the original, which, as most viewers will agree, it's not. But while the majority opinion online seems to be that the new Clone High is different because it's bad, I see it more as the new Clone High is different from the old Clone High because it's good in a different way, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. Just like my video about the new Total Drama from a few months back, I'm going to do a deep dive into the season and talk about how, despite diverting from the original in various ways, the new Clone High is still good. Gandhi, you've been pretty quiet. What's your take? Huh. Alright, while most of this video is going to be positive, it's hard to talk about this season without talking about the first episode, which I'm sure is the only episode that some people ever gave a chance to. And yeah, it, it's pretty rough. It's not a terrible episode, but it's pretty dang close. The cold open, just like the rest of the episode, feels like a bastardization of the show's comedy from the first season, as, especially with the lack of any of the main characters for the majority of it, the show starts off in a very non-clone high way. The setup for the season is is fairly easy with how they ended the original, as the show somewhat smoothly transfers to 2023 with a great, albeit somewhat forced, song from Scudworth, and beyond this episode, they hardly ever mention the time jump. Before getting to the rest of this episode though, we do get a look at the new intro, which might honestly be one of the greatest cartoon intros ever. While the original was great, Abandoned Pools delivers yet another banger with updated lyrics against this ridiculously well animated sequence with some genuinely beautiful shots, it's just really a fantastic sequence that's utterly unscapable. Anyway, back to the disappointing first episode. I think the problem with it is that, besides just being the least funny and the least visually interesting episode in the season, it also feels like it has no idea who any of the old or new characters are. I kind of thought this episode would be better once I came back and watched it after I was accustomed to the new cast, but instead, I just realized that the likable versions of characters like Frida and Harriet from the second half of the season are swapped out with insufferable clones and in this episode that make the whole thing just feel so weird. Seriously, Harriet and Frida are basically the same character in this episode, and there's not a single line from either of them in it that feels especially funny. They do improve drastically and quickly before the season's end, but back to this episode. It's one of only two in the season without a clear gimmick, as the only thing really going on are introducing the characters, clarifying that JFK and Joan are still a thing from the last season finale, and torturing Abe by transforming him into the personification of 2002 for the show to yell at for 22 minutes. We'll get more into the new characters and the comedy later, as I'm tired of being so critical for so long, but let's just get back to the final thing I want to talk about before moving on from the first episode, which is the lack of Gandhi this season. I'm not going to bore you with the whole how Gandhi's appearance cancelled the original speech or whatever, but this does a pretty good job in handling the poor deck they were dealt. The Gandhi references naturally become less and less prevalent as the season goes on, and as blasphemous as this sounds for how funny and pivotal his side plots were in the original, I wasn't really missing him this season by episodes 5 or 6. All the quote unquote Gandhi replacements do a good job in filling his role without feeling like a retread, and his disappearance wasn't nearly as noticeable as I thought it was going to be. Anyway, enough about the first tenth of the season and a character who's not in it, let's move on to the thing that arguably matters most in Clone High, the comedy. Phew. <gasps> In general, the season's comedy is at its best when it's character focused. Stuff like JFK sliding euphemisms into every conceivable sense, or Mr. B and Scudworth going on some unrelated escapade will always be the bread and butter of the show, but there are some other funny jokes in the series whenever it's not being surprisingly unnecessarily gory. Each episode gets quite a few jokes out of its main gimmick, as besides the first two episodes, which have much more standard plots in order to focus on establishing the characters, each episode has something that differentiates 
eliminates it from the rest of the series, as in something it's parodying or just some out of left field plot element. And that's where most of the comedy of the show that isn't focused on individual character quirks is based on, so let's just quickly go through all of them, besides the final two which I'm going to save for the end of the video. Episode 3, Anxious Times at Clone High, is a faux horror episode in which the heebie-jeebie travels around the school and tries to inflict as much stress as possible as every teen is afraid of something. Harriet in becoming a wine mom, Joan of losing herself in her relationship with JFK, Cleo in getting screen time, oh sorry I mean appearing unattractive or something, etc. And the show uses its art style to have some really funny shots in there too. Episode 4, The Crown, Joan Coming, it's a Cleo 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 Worlds gimmick, is that it's an apology for forgetting about Cleo for the first three episodes as it brings her back into the spotlight in a major way as she brainwashes everybody into acting like her. Her takeover of the school has some great visual gags, and the instructional boogie that Joan uses to eventually take her out fits the homecoming theme of the whole thing. Episode 5, Some Talking But Mostly Songs, is a musical episode, which while it doesn't get anywhere close to matching its title as there's about 4 minutes of singing in this 26 minute episode, the short amount of songs that are in it are pretty catchy and witty, and watching Harriet go full Charlie Kelly and trying to direct her musical is about as funny as the show ever gets. Episode 6, Saved by the Noel feels like the show trying to get back in touch with the whole parodying teen dramas thing that both the original and this season seem to forget about for periods of time, as Joan reveals a nostalgia-based medical condition that she forces Abe to keep secret. A lot of this episode is focused on the whole Abe and Joan JFK love triangle that I'll talk about more in a second, and as a result, besides the hilarious deep fried funeral that kicks this one off, this episode really isn't that funny in comparison to the rest of the episodes in the second half of the season. What is a funny episode though is episode 7, Spring Broken, which pretends to be about spring breaks before devolving into various desert-based humor, with JFK's brains reverse frying out, Abe and Calopatra taking on a zombie horde, and my favorite Scudworth and Mr. Beast subplot of the season as the pair share a desert mirage in the form of Vegas. This episode is the most consistently funny of the first eight, as it has some great jokes from wall to wall, and it sets up the couples that are expanded upon in episode 8, Sexy Ed. The final episode we're talking about in this segment, which is focused on establishing the relationships that are put to test in the finale, with the background of the school establishing a pro-sex agenda. The men from C, or the C-men who sing, are one of my favorite jokes in the season, and just the general absurdity of the plot is enough to keep this episode pretty funny, in addition to the silent film motif that occurs as Calopatra becomes official. As you can probably tell, I think that beyond the character establishing slogfests that are the first two episodes, that the rest of the season has has some great gimmicks that leads to some great jokes. But while this show is funny, it's not funny enough to hold your attention if you can at least get somewhat attached to its characters, which are what I'm going to spend the next chunk of the video talking about, starting with the main love triangle of it all, and Topher for some reason. We'll get through this, we just need to stick together! The sight of Joan is a constant reminder of how she wants me out of her sight. After the ending of the original, this season effectively becomes an exact inversion of its predecessor, with Joan dating the popular one in AFK, and Abe looking on from the outside. It's a dynamic that, while it doesn't feel as fresh as it did last season, still works fairly well, and I like most of the twists and turns in it as a will-they-won't-they they with Abe and Joan. Talking about each character individually for a second, Abe is perhaps the character that changes most from the original to this season, as he passes the protagonist baton to Joan and is forced to learn to play second fiddle, or third fiddle, or kind of just backup vocals as he goes missing for chunks of the season as his whole shtick becomes just being a loser. I like a lot of the stuff with his initial partner in crime, Topher, but despite the idea of a Columbus clone who hates their clone father being really clever, the show decides to kind of just get rid of him after the first two episodes until he comes back at the end to blackmail, or sorry, white leverage Abe out of talking to Joan for an episode and a half. So so that they can save their relationship for the second season. If you couldn't tell, I think Abe is the most misused character in the season, as it feels like the show doesn't know what to do with him now that Joan is the main character. He does get some better moments in the finale, but since I'm going to talk about that at the end of the video, I'll end talking about him here by just saying that perhaps the real loss of losing Gandhi is that Abe feels purposeless for long stretches of the season. JFK, on the other hand, is still the comedic powerhouse that he was in the first season, as while his voice isn't quite the same 
after 20 years. By the end of the season, the character is just as funny as he's ever been. He's also way more of an actual character than before, which while it does sometimes threaten just how funny he can be, it allows his relationship and subsequent breakup with Joan to actually mean something to the audience. His friendship with Confucius and quick fling with Harriet, both of which I'll get to in a second, are both fun ways to pair him up with the new cast, while most of his attention is still focused on Joan. And speaking of which, as I mentioned before, Joan is easily, without a doubt, and even more so than Abe in the first season, the main character of the Clone High reboot. And while they do have to smooth her edges, both literally and character-wise, to fit her into the protagonist's mold, I think ultimately she holds the position pretty well, as a nice bridge between the old and the new cast. She's the only clone who has a dynamic with every other clone, besides Topher who really doesn't count, and she actually has some kind of an on-screen relationship with Mr. B and Candide, the latter of which being her foster mother. But besides just being the most connected character, Joan is genuinely a good character to follow around as she's surprisingly grounded, which allows the viewer to actually care about her emotions and such, which is somewhat important as the Joan of K relationship is a big focus for the season as it delivers as the series' dramatic centerpiece. She also has the greatest moment in the show in the finale, but we'll get back to that later as it's time to talk about the three new main clones as well as the brand new Cleopatra. Uh, I I'm allergic to movies. Okay, bye. <laughs> As I very non-subtly alluded to multiple times in this video already, the show's first three episodes do their best in order to have as little Cleopatra as possible. Seriously, she's not involved in the A or B plots in any of these three episodes, which makes it a bit difficult to get adjusted to her voice change, something made even more challenging by the fact that her old voice actor is now the one behind Candide, a character with significantly more of an early show presence. And while episode three does give us a very Cleo-themed episode, most of the focus is still ironically on Joan, and the character once again disappears the next two episodes besides a small c-plot where she literally becomes a background dancer. So after six episodes, I sadly resigned myself to the idea that this season had made the decision that the ridiculously funny Cleopatra from its predecessor didn't fit into their new show. And then episodes seven and eight roll around, and like a phoenix from the ashes, Cleo rises once again. I'll get to the obvious thing in a second, I promise, but I appreciate how from episode seven on, they give Cleo some old-fashioned Cleopatra jokes that aren't reliant on her new dynamic with Frida. Would it have been cool if they had returned this version of the character to us sometime before the episode where they needed to set her up with Frida? Yeah, probably. But hey, everyone always remembers the end of the series more in the beginning, so as long as I only ever rewatch the last four episodes of the season, which are the best four anyway, I'll always think of this as a good Cleo season. On a more serious note though, as I try to say more positive things about this show in a video titled Clone High is Still Good, Frida and Cleo's relationship, or Calopatra, as one of the only ship names I'll ever use on this channel is by far the most interesting and the most funny in the show. Frida suddenly not being chill about something and Cleo suddenly caring about somebody are both nice inversions for their characters, and after the hilarious French film scene where they get together, which was exponentially more funny if you watched it on Max for the short period of time in which they force descriptive audio onto you, every scene of the two of them together afterwards does a good job in allowing both characters to still have their individual comedy while still using them together for great bits. Talking about Frida individually for a sec, after the first two episodes where her gimmick is being chill Harriet, she doesn't have a ton going on in comparison to the big three of the season, Joan, JFK, and Harriet, but she still has some pretty solid subplots in the spirit of Gandhi's in the original, albeit she never gets to fully separate from the rest of the gang. Her chill demeanor in comparison to the rest of the show's manic cast is pretty stellar throughout though. Speaking of manic, Harriet is easily my favorite new character this time around, as even after her rough start to the series, I feel like, while arguably being the second most prevalent character in the show, she still manages to be one of the most consistently funny characters in the season. Especially in the musical episode where her breakdown and trying to control everything about the play is utterly hilarious, and the following episode where she and JFK think they have a spark, her character, despite the very non-original clone high design, ends up really fitting into the world. I think an initial concern I had with the first two episodes is that they treat Harriet and Frida like normal people in comparison to the original clones, but by the end of the season she's just as unhinged 
unhinged as anybody else in the cast, and it's truly a delight to watch. Her relationship with Confucius, which gets the least amount of setup and development out of any pairing in the cast, does do a good job in reflecting the perfectionist element in her character, although it really doesn't do anything for him. Speaking of which, the last main clone we get to talk about is Confucius, and don't worry, this won't take too long. There really are two Confuciuses in this show, as he spends the first half or so of the season being the loser in the cast, or the joke is that nobody notices him. His side plots during this section with Abe and JFK are both really enjoyable, but after those subside, his character suddenly becomes him being lazy because he has rich foster parents or something. If you were wondering where Cleo's surge of screen time in the second half of the season comes from, it's from Confucius, as he kind of just disappears for a while and comes back as a rich kid who's interested in Harriet, who he then just kind of follows around. I do think he has the potential to become something interesting in season 3 or 2 or whatever we're calling the next season, but as for his appearance in this one, he's only slightly more interesting than Topher, which is kind of a shame. Anyway, he's the last of the clones, so I'll have a bit more about them at the end of the video. Let's finally get to the faculty of Clone High, Candide, Scudworth, and Mr. B. Don't worry, I got this. Just like the original, almost every episode this time around has a B-plot revolving around Scudworth and Mr. Besley Butler drawn shenanigans that usually loosely tie into whatever the clones are getting into. And just like the original, these subplots are perhaps the most consistently funny part of every episode. Even if the team plot occasionally devolves into unnaturally breaking the fourth wall or something, you can always count on Scudworth and Mr. B to deliver a really funny plot that feels the closest to the series' predecessor. The show does a really good job in knowing when Mr. B needs to be the straight man, like in most of Scudworth's attempts to seduce Candide, and when to just let both characters run loose, which is done best in their joint Vegas mirage. Speaking of Candide, she's the final addition to the show that I've yet to talk about, and I think she works really well as both a physical embodiment of the board of shadowy figures, as well as a way to shake up Scudworth's and Mr. B's dynamic in a way that allows for new stories, while still keeping in the spirit of the original. Scudworth and Candide's joke pairing works really well when the two are scheming how to effectively torture the clones, and it's something that builds up really well to the finale, which is also when the fact that Candide is Joan's foster mother actually matters for once, but I'll get to all of that in a second. First though, no discussion of these three, and especially Mr. B, would be complete without diving into episode 9, the well-named Emmy Bait, for your consideration. For anybody who made it this far in the video who didn't make it this far in the season, this is your last chance to leave and watch the episode before I spoil it, but man, is it fantastic. It's the only episode of the season to not have any side plots or anything, as we get 22 minutes of Mr. B's dramatic backstory and explanation for why he calls everybody Wesley. Which, side note, he strangely doesn't for the first six or so episodes of the season, but whatever, this episode is great. To start with the obvious, the different art styles in this episode are all stunning, and the show really commits to all three of them. While they do bring a small bit of sadness that we don't get an entire show with them, especially the second one with its absolutely beautiful watercolor backgrounds, they all do a really terrific job in making this episode feel special. What also accomplishes this goal is the story, which while being hilariously absurd, as the plot is that Mr. B calls people Wesley after his late brother who drowned because he couldn't swim and fell in after trying to baptize Mr. B in the middle of the lake and that he wants Scudworth the clone, but the clone of Wesley eventually falls into the water too to definitely never come back not never. Despite all of that just being the surface of the plot in this episode, I didn't even mention the VCR affair, the episode still manages to fit in some genuine, genuine moments of Mr. B that make him feel like an actual character. Add in some of the funniest jokes in the season as the show parodies typical Emmy bait while also somewhat being Emmy bait, and you get a really fun episode that would be the best of the season if not for the immensely strong finale that follows. Speaking of which, it's finally time to talk about the season finale, which is, in my opinion, the strongest outing in the entire Clone High franchise. Hey, are you okay? I saw you left Confucius behind. I'm so good. I am so good. The finale's premise is fairly simple, being that the clones are put through a death maze with the guys of the winner going to Clone High College, with the real goal being to find the next world leader to conclude Operation Spread Eagle. Which while this does sound crazy for most shows, it's pretty standard for Clone High, but it's what this finale does character-wise that makes it so fantastic. 
Besides Topher and Confucius, who really don't matter and really aren't missed, every other character arguably has their best or their second best episode in this one. Scudworth and Mr. B getting fired and then accidentally killing every member of the board of shadowy figures is hilarious. Harriet slowly realizing that leaving her boyfriend to seemingly die is a great evolution of her character, and somewhat of a finale to her season-long arc. Frida and Cleo get a full episode of their pairing with some fantastic jokes in there. Abe and JFK bond over their love of Joan, giving them their largest interaction in the franchise and best of all, Candide and Joan are at their absolute best here. Besides Candide's fantastic musical number about clone high collars that kicks this one off, it's also the episode where she feels most like an actual villain, and the ending where she welcomes Joan after her victory is genuinely chilling. But before we get to the ending, we gotta talk about Joan. As over 15 years after Total Drama ripped off their art style, Clone High takes a page from TD's book and lets their redhead go feral. Seriously though, Joan trying her best to be a good friend before Frida is forced to save Cleo over her is an actual good dramatic moment, as while Frida was probably justified in saving her girlfriend if she could only save one of two people, anybody would be as upset as Joan if somebody they just spent 10 minutes calling their friend chose to let them die, which makes the following 8 minutes, with Joan slowly killing each one of her friends, at least to her knowledge, a really fun and interesting watch. There are a bunch of really cool shots and really funny jokes in this sequence too, and the horror in Joan as Candy congratulations congratulates her for outlasting all of her fellow students, culminates in this fantastic piece of art with Joan resembling her clone mother as she starts to fear all the ways they're similar. Joan knocking her out with a yearbook is a great beginning to the final action scene of the season 2, as the show begins to set up its cliffhanger, as after restoring her friend's memories with a slideshow backed by a fantastic track from Abandoned Pools, as Joan tries to reinforce the idea that she does actually care about people, her lone wolf antics are revealed to her friends by eventual candy indeed, leaving this absolutely terrific season finale with Joan having to face the wrath of her friends as we cut to credits. This is where somebody better at reviewing shows might have a conclusion to wrap up this whole video, but since I've made my opinions on the series pretty clear for the last 20 minutes, as first half bad, second half good, Abe, Confucius, Topher boring, everybody else not, I thought I'd wrap up this video by talking about what things I would want to see in the next season. I'm not going to talk about specific plot details like how they would pick up from the cliff hanger, but in general, I hope the season trend of the show getting progressively significantly better continues, or at least the show keeps the quality of this season's second half. Besides the obvious of there being more character-based humor and less blood stuff, I hope the show continues down the route of being more experimental and openly weird, and that we get another one-off single plot episode in the vein of For Your Consideration. But most of all, I hope the show continues to strike a balance in between wanting to please fans of the original and wanting to be its own thing as I'm not sure it would have been the first cartoon in quite a bit that I've actually enjoyed coming back to watch week after week if that wasn't the case. Because in many ways, I feel like if the show had tried to emulate what a potential 2003 second season of the original would have looked like, it would have lost a lot of the charm that the series is going for, as the show is always meant to parody modern events, which I think will give this season the nostalgic feeling of its predecessor when it also reaches 20 or so years old. But for now, as long as you go into this season open-minded about what a Clone High reboot should be, you'll find a beautifully animated season that while it does have some issues, is filled with some hilarious jokes, genuinely dramatic moments, and faithful continuations for many of the show's now iconic characters. And Abe is there too, I guess. Anyway, that's about it for me. Thank you so much to anybody who made it this far in the video, as I know it's not the typical Ample Samuel talk about a Cartoon Network episode for 10 minute video, so thanks for anybody who stuck with it anyway. If you want to see what I'm working on next, or find even more terrible animation opinions, my Twitter is in the description. But either way, this has been Ample Samuel, and I'll see you in hopefully about 96 hours with a more typical Ample video. Thanks for watching.